So it's open theme um, over the over these few weeks in the summer. Um, sometimes we do a bit of an open theme, and, and really an open theme is when you get to talk about the things that are a bit of a bee in your bonnet. And um, so last week, uh, Rob talked about prayer, and it was great, wasn't it? Because Rob, on prayer, he's, you know, he's a man of prayer, and he gets results, doesn't he? And all those stories, they keep flowing about, you know, answers to prayer. It's brilliant. Well, tonight I'm going to talk about reading the Bible. And um, anyone who sort of lives near me or in my house will probably sort of slightly groan at this point because it is something I go on and on and on about a little bit. And um, I suppose what I feel is that there's a bit of a sense that reading the Bible as a thing is being eroded a bit, even amongst the church at the moment, particularly maybe amongst younger people. Though, having said that, a recent survey put Bristol um, right at the top with a couple of other areas that are in the country of Bible reading. And do you know which age group was at the top of that? It was a good survey. It's interesting. 20 to 29-year-olds. Mm, you weren't expecting that, were you? Apparently, they were level with the 85 pluses. That's really baffling, isn't it? Anyway, I'll give you the link to the sur survey if you don't believe me. So, do you read your Bible much? Do you read it anymore? Did you used to read it and have found that it's, it's gone down a little bit? Are you somebody who's quite new to all this faith stuff and you don't get the Bible and you're not quite sure how you're supposed to read it or what, you know, what you're supposed to do with it. Do you read it on paper, plasma, or paper? Put your hand up if you're more of a plasma. Reading it on digital, that is. <laughs> oh, a few. What about paper? Who's more? Oh, I'm so pleased with you. Well done. That's very good. I had a bit of an argument with one of my sons about this, and he said, Mum, you're on hiding to nothing. It's not happening. People are going digital. Sorry. And I was like... No. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about a thing they call deep reading. So, the scientists have been looking at reading habits. And one of the things they've noticed is that your eyes behave differently when you're reading plasma to paper. So, when, yeah. so when you're reading a digital screen, your eyes are all over the place. And you're used to getting feeds from the side and little adverts and all sorts of things. And your eyes have learned how to zip all over the page and take in information. And we've become very adept at it. But interestingly, if you then transfer your reading to a piece of paper or into a book, for example, which they call linear reading, our eyes have become less adept at the straightforward linear reading. They call it deep reading because it requires more concentration and these scientists that have done this study were saying that that we've become very good at one thing but that ability to deep read to focus in on paper is being eroded so there's a question really is that a good bad a good or a bad thing or does it really matter well let's just I just want to talk to you about the bible a little bit tonight so 500 years ago if you'd lived here in Bristol 500 years ago, it would have been illegal for you to have had a Bible in English. The priests and the clergy and the church leaders said you couldn't have one because you wouldn't be able to understand it. And they are the ones that un can understand it. And you're not allowed to even see it in English. You've just got to hear the Bible interpreted for you by church leaders. It was actually illegal. And in 1519, seven Christians were burnt at the stake for teaching their children the Lord's Prayer in English in the UK. And the only legal Bible was in Latin. But then in the mid-1520s, about 1526, black market Bibles started to leak into Britain and England. And the authorities panicked. The Bishop of London bought as many as he could on the black market and burnt them. But the money that he, trans he gave over to buy these black, black market Bibles actually went to the person who'd printed them 
and he used them to print a whole load more. And that man was William Tyndale. And he was heard to say this. He was heard to say, I expect they'll want to burn me too. And this may yet happen if it's God's will. As if he maybe had a bit of a premonition of what was coming as he embarked on this thing. So this man was William Tyndale. He was born here locally. He was born up the road in Gloucester. Not a lot is known about his early life except that he went to Oxford University and he studied theology and he found it really exasperating. Studying theology because he wasn't allowed to read the Bible in English um, and even get to the Bible because these theologians, they wanted to be the ones who interpreted it. And he got into all sorts of arguments. And one day he was, he was found preaching outside Bristol Cathedral on the green outside. And he was arrested for heresy because of what he was saying. And he was taken before the clergyman. And there's this famous um, interaction where this clergyman says, said to him this. He said, only a language like Latin or Greek is able to fully convey God's truth. English is a vulgar language, fine for plowmen and shopkeepers, but hardly suitable for the Bible. And this incensed William Tyndale, and he determined even more, and he shouted back, if God spares my life, I intend to make it possible for a common plowman and a farmer to know more of the scripture than you do. And he in, in, in his heart, he determined that he was going to solve this problem, and he was pursued by the authorities out of the country and he ended up in Germany and he was pursued in Germany and he then went to Belgium and he went to a place, a city called Worms. And there, yeah, strange old name, isn't it? And there he started to translate the Bible into English. And he was absolutely convinced, he had become convinced that people, if they could have access to the Bible in English, in their own language, then they would be able to develop a personal relationship with God that, that um, was, gave them direct access to, access to God. And he was absolutely sure that God was calling him to do that. And he encouraged people to break the law as these Bibles started to appear and to read them. He said, because it will make your soul well. It will make you healthy in your soul. And as he was translating, he was kind of living in secret and he would minister to the poor. And he said that he kept on saying, I'm not with Christ if I'm not doing what he teaches me in the Bible. But in the, and in the next 10 years, these Bibles that he translated started to flood back. But they, they started to brew a bit of a storm. There's one that is, that is a William Tyndale early copy. They flooded back to Britain, and they, they brewed a bit of a storm in, in, in Europe, and people were caught with the Bible, were sent to prison, and the prison, prisons began to be overflowing with people who had been caught with copies of the Bible in English. Uh, and, but people were be beginning to discover something quite dramatic, that they could have this direct access to God, and they could know him personally for themselves and discover stuff about him. And it was such a powerful idea that even the people that were pursuing them, trying to arrest everybody, started to be converted and find Jesus. And they were then burnt at the stake. It was a horrendous time, but something was like a storm was brewing. Eventually, a man called Henry Phillips um, befriended William Tyndale and led him into a trap, basically. And he was arrested and put in a dungeon for 18 months. And he carried on his translation work. And he was witnessing to the jailers, and they became Christians too. He was unstoppable. And eventually, he was, after 18 months, he was taken out of this dungeon, and he was strangled. He was put to trial, he was found guilty, and he was strangled, and then burnt at the stake. And his, as he was burnt at the stake, it said that he cried out in this prayer, O Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Henry VIII was on the throne at the time, and he was praying that Henry VIII would see this had to happen, that the Bible needed to be translated into um, English. And three years later, his prayer was answered when King Henry VIII actually decreed that every single church in England should have an English Bible. Fascinating, isn't it? Imagine it being illegal to have a Bible. 
And there are places around the world right now where it is illegal. If you're found with a Bible, then you could be put to death or have all your property confiscated. In America, nine out of ten of the homes have a Bible. But only one in five Christians read it regularly. 60% of Americans think that Billy Graham wrote the Sermon on the Mount. The writing on the wall, who's heard of that phrase? Where is it from? It's from the Bible. But 20% of people think it's from the Bible. 20% of people think the Beatles said it. Eat, drink, and be merry. Where's it from? Who said it? Who said Shakespeare? Much more people, 40% of people say Shakespeare. Actually, 10% say it's in the Bible. Jesus said it. It's in Luke. In the UK, I think we're slightly better. We've got about a third of Christians read their Bible regularly, at least once a week. Um, so what about you? Are you somebody who, who reads the Bible and sees it as something that's part of your life that you can't do without? Are you somebody who wrestles with the Bible, feels like, you know, you, you feel guilty because you don't read it enough? I kind of think guilt about not reading the Bible is not a thing now. It was kind of big in the 80s, I think. But now reading the Bible, people don't really seem to mind so much. But, you know, are you somebody who's wrestled with it, struggled with it, finds it boring? I can remember my own history with the Bible started, well, from a very early age. My, my mum would read us stories from the Bible from a very early age. But I can remember this time when I was about 15 when I read a psalm. And I think for the first time in my kind of more adult conscious life, I just heard God's voice as I was reading it. It was it was just directly speaking to a particular thing that I was fussing about at the time, I think. And I felt like there was this sense of presence that came as I read these words. And I remember thinking, ah, is that what's supposed to happen then? And it sort of woke up this intrigue in me. And over the years, I have I have built up a bit of a history with the Bible, and there have been many, many times, more times than I can remember or count now, where I felt as I've read this sense of the presence of God and the speaking voice of God coming through the words of the Bible. And it's become something that is one of my great loves, the Bible is. It's been woven into my history. And... No, it's in my family's history. My mum's a great Bible reader. I used to watch her reading the Bible, wondering why she used to read it so much. And um, In fact, I brought this to show you. This is part of my history too. This is my great-grandmother's Bible. She was called Hannah Jackson. And she was born in 1873. And Hannah was, she was very poor. She was widowed in her early 30s, and was left, she, there was no social security, no money for her at all. She, she lived on a tiny amount of money. My mum was saying to me earlier on today that there's a letter from her to another relative saying, could you um, lend me a pen, sixpence, because I need to pay a bill. She was very, very poor. But this is her Bible, and in this Bible are things that have been underlined by Hannah Jackson, and you can see her history as it unfolds. She's written some things there. Those are some, a prayer, that's a prayer that she wrote. And it kind of quotes some bits from the Bible, but it's obviously her heartfelt prayer for her life. It says this, I must work the works of him that has sent me while it's day, for the night comes when no man can work. That's a quote from Jesus. But she goes on to say, which means that we must do all the good that we can let no opportunity pass by unheeded, for the years of our lives are swiftly flying away, and we shall soon have the twilight of old age creeping on each hour. So let us rise early in the day with Christ, and say with Samuel of old, Lord, what would you have had me to do, that I may work out my own salvation with fear and trembling? Amazing words from a woman who had no money and was managing her life on very few resources but she had this resource the bible and 
you know, she underlines in it um, some verses from 1 Corinthians where she says, um, God has made, made the foolish things of the wor- world to shame the wise. You know, this verse that talks of how the wisdom of God is strange to the world. And I kind of wonder what she was going through as she realized that she was a weak thing of the world. But God was speaking to her, I think. And I, I just want to, I wanted to encourage you, I suppose, or re-encourage you if you've lost some vision for reading the Bible, that you can have a history with the Bible that can build over the years and it can be woven into your life so that it becomes part of you and it brings such a strength and it brings wisdom and it, it makes sense in a world that is so often lacking wisdom with so many loud voices and so much chaos. There's something extraordinary about this book. And I just want to remind you of that. I'm just going to look at um, a verse from Hebrews. And let's have a read of that. This is from the chapter 4 of Hebrews. And this, every now and again, the Bible describes itself to us, <laughs> what it's doing and how it works. And this is one such verse But it's an amazing verse because it describes not just the power of the Bible, but how it affects us and how it touches our lives. It says this, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Amazing words. They're powerful, aren't they? And it's, it's speaking about the, the Bible itself. And I just want to just pick up a few things from there. It speaks of this idea that the words of Scripture are living and active. It uses two words, zoe and enege. And these two words, they actually mean alive as in the sense that God is alive. So the word Zoe, that says there where the words of God are living and active, living there, it uses this word that says that the life of God lives and resides in these words. It's got that kind of life. It's not alive in just the sense that some creature on earth is it's actually from the source of life itself god is the origin of life and it has this other um, word energy which is energy where we get our word energy from so this word where it says living and active it's actually saying it's alive and it's got energy that is how the writer of hebrews is describing scripture so when we encounter the bible and the words of the bible there's this alive energy that starts to impact our lives. And he's saying, this writer, or she is saying, whoever it is, we don't know who the writer of Hebrews is, that that get hold of this truth deeply. Let it penetrate right down because there's a life and energy to the words of Scripture. They're supposed to go in deep. Not just be skimmed over, but go in deep. And it's got a power in it that gets to work beneath the surface. And I have seen that power at work many times. I see it at work when I pray with people. And particularly in prayer ministry, sometimes we we try and um, we have a bit of a a kind of set of, of Bible verses that we often use in prayer ministry. I've seen the power of Psalm 139. Who knows which is that psalm? You know, it's one of the most well-known psalms. It's the psalm where David says, God, you know me. You made me. You know me. You searched me. You see see me from afar. You see when I lie down, when I stand up. Wherever I go, I can't get away from you. And then he goes on to say that you saw me when I I was made in the depths of the womb of my mother. You saw me when I was knit together, he says, in those powerful words, in the secret place. All the days given to me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Incredible words about the origin of each and every human being. Each of you that applies to. And I've seen the power of that. As that reality hits a human life, 
someone who has felt maybe that they are completely irrelevant, that they were somebody that was forgotten, that nobody, that God doesn't know or care about, to know that God was present, designing, drawing together the strands of the human personality, knitting together, already aware of your life as it would unfold. It's an incredibly powerful reality. I've seen it affect people's lives as it goes in beneath the surface. I've seen the power of scripture in deliverance, in actually confronting the power of evil, when people are trapped by powers of evil and darkness, by fear that they cannot shake off. I've seen the power of scripture as it confronts a fear. The scripture that says perfect love drives out fear. I've seen it affect a person, many people, as they've taken on board this idea that I'm perfectly loved by God. And that actually is the answer to fear. The scripture is powerful and we're encouraged by this writer, not just to skim read, not to read like we read plasma screens, but to deep read and allow that reality to hit, uh, to, to go further down. So it's living and active. And I just want to say this to you, that we need to expect to encounter something that is alive with an energy. Expect to encounter God when we read the scripture. You know what uh, Gandhi said about the Bible? It's, it's interesting. He never became a Christian, Gandhi didn't, because he was intrigued. He wanted to follow Jesus. But he went into a church and he was turned away because he was too low caste for that particular church. And he left it. But he said this, you Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces. Turn the world upside down and bring peace to a battle-torn planet. But you treat it as if it is nothing more than a piece of literature. It's challenging, isn't it? Let's really encounter the Bible as a living and active thing. So, second point. Don't just read the Bible. Experience it. What does that mean? There's a story in Scripture. It unfolds from the very beginning. It's not just a bunch of random pieces of advice. It's full of stories. And the stories unfold from the dawn of creation to the last moment of human time. It's an incredible story. And in the story, Jesus appears. But he appears not, um, you know, as just the, just the main event. He is the main event. But there's this incredible setting where he's been talked about and anticipated and longed for. And then he comes. And then this new church is born. It's an incredible unfolding story. And the Jewish people, they were taught um, to hand on stories to each other. Do you see the Bible as a story or do you just pick a verse? Let me ask you, are you someone who reads the Bible by getting a verse a day on your phone? I mean, it's a fine thing to do, but don't miss the experience of reading the story of the Bible. John Piper, who's a great Bible scholar, said this, it's not just a string of pearls, pearls of wisdom. He said it's a chain of linked thoughts so see it as something that has this whole sense. I remember a time a few years ago when I got the Message Bible for the first time. Who's got the Message Bible? It's kind of like a bit more of a modern paraphrase where Eugene Peterson became passionate about trying to tran uh, translate the Bible into something that would get people excited. He realized that his theology students that he was teaching weren't particularly excited about the Bible. And he was puzzled by it because he was. And he's somebody who knew was fluent in Greek. And he realized that um, in New Testament times, particularly, there were two forms of Greek, which the Bible was written in. Um, two forms. There was kind of like a poetic, formal, Shakespearean sort of language that was for poetry and performance. But there was also like a street version of Greek. And he realized that the New Testament was actually written in this street version. It wasn't written as a formal bit of poetry. It was actually written to engage with people on the street in everyday lives. So 
he wrote this incredible version of the Bible. And I remember once reading the book of the Gospel of John all the way through in a sitting. And it took about two hours. And something completely changed about my understanding of what Jesus was like through that one experience. I remember putting it down and shutting it at the end and thinking to myself, Jesus was really on top of it all. Even though he died in the story, there was this extraordinary sense that came through from reading it in one go that Jesus knew what was going on and he was actually quite relaxed. Even in the face of death, you know, he stands before Pilate and he says, you don't take my life from me. I'm laying it down. There's this amazing sense of who Jesus is. I have this renewal of my understanding of what Jesus is really like. Have you ever done that? Read a gospel all the way through in one setting. Just want you to listen to this. Um, there's a little film clip here. It's two minutes long of Tom Wright. So Tom Wright is one of our great sort of beloved theologians of um, the 21st century and 20th, actually. He's an amazing scholar, amazing uh, novel, uh, writer who's written many books. But he just talks here about how to read the Bible. I just want you to listen to his words. They're great. The Bible was not primarily written in order to be read in 10 verse chunks. Um, we have cut the Bible down to size. Now, obviously, there are some bits, like the Psalms, and like some passages, like the book of James, is, is written in very short bursts. But most of it, including Paul's letters, and certainly the Gospels, and certainly great books like Isaiah and so on, are, are read in order to be experienced the way you experience a symphony. Um, yeah, imagine if you went to a concert and you got the first 10 bars of Beethoven 5 and then the conductor turned around and said, okay, that, that's all for this week, come back same time next week and we'll have the next 10 bars. You think, wait, well, hey, this, this is... And if somebody said, oh, but if you listen to the whole thing, you'd never remember it all, you think, well, that's not the point. You don't listen to it in order to remember. You will remember quite a lot of it. You listen to it in order to be... Um, swept along in the full flow and sweep and flood of it. And, and I grieve over the fact that there are many, many Christians who have never, ever read one of the Gospels or even one of the Epistles straight through at a sitting. John's Gospel, even slowly, will take you two hours. Um, now, if you're really engrossed in a novel, you'd read that for that long quite easily. Why not just allow the thing to wash over you? Of course, then, there's all the time in the world to go back and say, I really now want to do a study on John chapter 13 or whatever it is and go down into the details of the words. But see the parts in the light of the whole. And that means the whole Bible. Um, and, and one could talk all evening about you know, all the different things that happen when you see, say, the whole of Genesis and Exodus as one single narrative and how that actually works from the beginning to the end. The whole of the Pentateuch, though, the whole, as I said before, the book of Isaiah, or the way that the Psalms fit together into their whole book, and so on and so on. And my uh, favorite, really, where I started was, was Romans. But most people read Romans in little bits. And even those who think they know Romans reasonably well, they tend to know bits of Romans 1, 2, and 3, then little bits of 5, 6, 7, and 8. And then they worry about 9 to 11, and there's some interesting stuff at the back. But instead, see Romans as a symphony in four movements. Think how the themes work. Until we wrestle with scripture like that, we're really not honoring it. You know, if this is the book God meant us to have by the Spirit, then it's important that we actually uh, take that seriously instead of just snipping it down to make it um, digestible like somebody with a huge banquet in front of them who insists on going to the back room and just making a peanut butter sandwich instead. Good words. It's a good recommendation, isn't it? So read the Bible as a symphony. A symphony. And maybe that would be something you could do as a result of this. You could go off and, and look at it. And I'm, I, can't, I could keep going on this, so I'm, I'm going to have to cut short what I wanted to say. But I just want to say this too, that if you read the Bible expecting to change then it will not disappoint. And, you know, Brother Yun, he, he, do you know who Brother Yun is? He's a Chinese Christian who suffered a great de deal of persecution, but has led this extraordinary life, led many thousands, millions of people to Christ. And he said this, if you don't open the Bible expecting to change, you're just reading words. Actually, the Bible expects to change you. 
God, the Spirit, expects to change you when you read the Bible. And in that verse, um, it talks about the Bible, uh, the words of Scripture penetrating down to soul and spirit. And it uses these two words. It says that it's going to move asunder, move apart, get right down to soul and spirit. It uses these two words. One which, which really speaks, the soul speaks of the seat of our human affections, the things we love, the things that make us us, uniquely us. And then it talks about the spirit, and the spirit is the spark of God life that has been placed in you. The Holy Spirit as he's come and ignited your life and awoken you to who you really are. And it says that the words of scripture are designed to penetrate down to that place where there's a war for the affections, where there's a war for supremacy. And that is actually what happens when we read scripture and we, we, we find it confronts the things that we love, our great affections in life. It, it confronts that thing we call idolatry, which is our tendency to put something else in the place of God. It confronts our fear and our anxiety. John Piper says, read the Bible to your anxiety. How about that? Instead of just longing for a comforting word, read it to your anxiety. And tell your anxiety to calm down in the light of these extraordinary truths. There are 365 commands in the Bible that say, don't fear. Look them up. That's a good thing to do. And just to finish, you know, you've got to read the Bible with the Holy Spirit, in the company of the Holy Spirit. We've all been aware of, perhaps even recently in... Um, what is going on in America. There's a certain sector of society that, is, that claims the Bible um, justifies racism. And, you know, the words of the Bible many times have been used as a battering tool, something to hurt and harm people instead of a tool to shape and craft our souls. But you, because you've got to read the Bible with the Holy Spirit. It is a divine book, yes, but it's a human book too. It's written by human beings. And God, when he commissioned the writing of the Bible in all its glory and, <laughs> and array, you know, he didn't just possess human beings so that they became robots. You still see the personalities of prophet after prophet as the Bible is written. The personalities and the pain and the suffering of some of the people who have written the Bible come out through the text because God is here, but also so is our humanity. And so when we read the Bible, we need to ask the Holy Spirit, show me what is going on here. You cannot just take it word for word without understanding. Actually, what happens is that the Spirit is available to us when we read the, read the Bible to enable our own spirit to rise up in response to what the Bible is calling out of us. And you need the Holy Spirit. You need to ask him, the indwelling spirit, to, to come, ask him, say, be with me as I read. Be with me as I discover. Show me, illuminate these scriptures to me so that I can encounter the living God because that's the point of reading the Bible. It's supposed to lead us through the words, through the imagery, through the stories to the living one who is actually the word of God. Jesus actually said it would be better for the disciples if he went because the Holy Spirit would come to them and he would lead them into all truth. And so our, our challenge as we read the Bible is not to just be literalists, to just say, well, I'm going to do this because it says so. It is to be led into truth. And you know what Jesus said the truth would do? He said it would set us free. And the great diagnostic test, if you like, of whether we've got it, is that we should be finding freedom. It's always about freedom, ultimately, because that's what Jesus came to lead us into, the freedom of knowing and loving God as renewed children, as, as people of the new birth. So, read the Bible. <laughs> I hope that you might feel a fresh bit of appetite to read the Bible and to weave it into your history. I hope that one day, if you're young at this or new at this, you could, you could say that 
you know, when you're older, that this, is, this Bible has woven itself through my history and I have been transformed by it as I've, uh, I've encountered it and I've read it and I've weighed it and I've allowed it to penetrate right down so that I can meet the God of all creation in these pages. So that's my prayer for us, that we would be, it's great that actually that survey shows we're doing well, but my prayer is that we would be shaped as a community by reading the Bible in a fresh way. So I'm going to pray and hand over to Nigel. So God, we, we thank you for this amazing book. It is a book that we fail to grasp a lot of the time. It's majesty and it's glory. And it's power to liberate us. But we pray that we as a community would begin to get hold of it. And perhaps in a new way, this week encounter you, the living water in the pages of the Bible. May that happen, we pray. God, I pray that by your spirit, you would set up encounters and moments with you where you lead and guide and refresh and restore our souls this week through the pages of the living word. For Jesus' sake, amen. Claire, thank you. I'm just going to ask you one question, Claire, just to, as we end this up. For you, um, Claire's been involved in pastoral ministry here at Woodlands Church for a long time. Claire, what would you say is the, the key effect of, for us, I guess, as Christians, people who are following Jesus, but kind of not getting into the Bible? What, what have you seen? How is that the knock-on effects of that? Hmm. Um, in a short little answer <laughs> I think it's I don't want to say anything too mean <laughs> um, I think that it makes us lightweight as okay. Christians really so I, I think there's something that comes as you that you have your own independent walk with God instead of just sort of gleaning it from um, you know a word for the day or a worship song and okay. Actually, just a, a little aside, you know, a lot of the worship songs we sing, if you're kind of new to faith, you might sometimes think these are strange words. And if, if they sound strange, it's probably because they're directly lifted from the Bible. So I just challenge you that if you're singing something, you think, what on earth does that mean? Go and Google it and see whether you can find it in the Bible. But, you know, those, yeah. My anchor holds within the veil. Yeah, <laughs> that one. <laughs> Indeed. Claire, thank you. And uh, we, we, we really hear your passion and encouragement to us that we want to, yeah, live closely with the word. And we see that in your life, Claire, that you, you've built your life on not only following Jesus, but loving and going deeply into the word. So thank you for what you've shared with us this evening. Well done, you. Grace. Oh, yeah. Well done.